So it seems redundant to say, but I'll say it anyway. Today we're here to celebrate Resurrection Sunday. It's a powerful day of remembrance in the Christian community. We all take time to reflect on Jesus, the Son of God, who was betrayed, beaten, mocked, tried in court, sentenced to death, crucified, and buried. He was the sacrifice for our sins so that we could return to that Eden-esque relationship that God had with man before the fall. There is so much power and so much love in his act of sacrifice. And then you add to the sacrifice the wow factor of what happened on the third day, the surprise ending to it all. Jesus rose from the dead. Death was not able to defeat him, but he conquered death in the grave and lives were forever changed and he reigns for eternity at the right hand of the Father. Some of you probably remember some of the old hymns that were sung on Easter morning. Others of you, the songs that we sang have become the songs that you think of for Easter. So I want to challenge you to listen to a few words from some of the old hymns and let them connect. I know sometimes young people, they listen and they're so turned off by the chord progressions and the simplicity of the melodies that they don't even let the words grab hold. And so this morning, without the musical background, unless I feel like breaking into song, which probably will not happen, um, I want you to just listen to these. This was one of my favorites growing up. It was Christ the Lord is Risen Today, and it was by Charles Wesley and Lyra Davidica. Christ the Lord is risen today. Alleluia. Can't, I'm not going to do all those alleluias. I'll just say alleluia from now on. Earth and heaven in chorus say alleluia. Raise your joys and triumphs high. Alleluia. Sing ye heavens and earth reply. Alleluia. Love's redeeming work is done. Alleluia. Fought the fight, the battle won. Hallelujah. Death in vain forbids him rise. Christ has opened paradise. Hallelujah. Another one, low in the grave he lay. Uh, this was from Robert, by Robert Lowry, and it was funny. I grew up in a Methodist church, and it was funny when I, this was the song, and on Easter, this is the song my sister still, when we talk about Easter, this is what she will burst into with great enthusiasm. And it was funny because when I looked it up to read the words, it said in the United Methodist hymnal on page... I, so I thought, well, no wonder. Okay, so it's low in the grave he lay, Jesus my Savior... Waiting the coming day, Jesus my Lord. Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph o'er his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. I still, when I say it, I still see my sister. <laughs> uh, the next one, uh, this was also a classic and has been done by many famous uh, recording artists, The Old Rugged Cross. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. And probably a more, much more recent contemporary song that the children especially all love by Tim Hughes, Happy Day. The greatest day in history, death is beaten, you have rescued me. Sing it out, Jesus is alive. The empty cross, the empty grave, life eternal, you have won the day. Shout it out, Jesus is alive, he's alive. Oh, happy day, happy day. 
and I can picture all the children dancing, dancing, dancing their hearts out. And you know, when you read those words, sometimes when we sing them, the words just sometimes don't have the same impact than when they're just proclaimed over us. The bridge, oh, what a glorious day, what a glorious way that you saved me. Oh, what a glorious day, what a glorious name. Amen. Such a powerful day that we celebrate, but sometimes our familiarity can become our greatest enemy in relationships. Things that are highly significant and should have the highest priority can become systematic and nothing more than a nostalgic trip down memory lane. It can become routine and it can lack life. We can start simply going through the motions and our heart connection is lost. Like in the scripture from Revelations chapter 2, verses 2 to 4, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you that you have left your first love. We do all the right things. We say all the right things and yet something is missing. Our heart connection just isn't the same as it was when we first were saved. And so this last week, the Lord just started speaking to me about keeping it fresh. Keeping it fresh. In the midst of any long-term relationship, there is the challenge to keep it fresh. John and I celebrate our 40th anniversary in June you hoo And I can say still, you know, you have to work at keeping it fresh after 40 years. The things that we were all goo-goo-eyed over when you first got married and thought you would hang on every word, suddenly just isn't the same anymore. And so you have to sometimes be intentional about sewing back in and keeping it fresh. The same thing happens with us and our relationship with the Lord. Not that he ever leaves us or that we don't say, well, I'm not, I don't believe anymore. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that that zeal, that excitement, the thrill, the creative pulse, that that sometimes can begin to wane. And we have to work at keeping it fresh. And so on this Resurrection Sunday morning, I just want to say, let's all take a challenge to keep it fresh. Let's look at how we can blow freshness back into personal relationships, but more importantly, into our relationship with the Lord. And so, as a starting place, I started in the dictionary to find out the definition of fresh. I started in the contemporary Webster's Dictionary, and then there just wasn't enough meat there, so I decided to go back to the 1828 Noah Webster's Dictionary because there's so much life there, and just so uh, the words are so colorful. So the first one has a colorful word in it that I'm going to define, so don't freak out when you hear it. But it's moving with celery, and that does not mean walking around with a piece of celery. What it means is with rapid motion and swiftness as a fresh breeze, a fresh wind. That's right out of the dictionary. So think about that. Moving with rapid motion with a new breeze and a fresh wind. Thinking about the wind of the breeze obviously should make most of us think about the Holy Spirit. Fresh is moving with the Holy Spirit. There is a big difference in doing things for the Lord and doing things with the Lord. 
One implies doing things out of duty or to get recognition, and the other one talks about relationship and love. So we can ask ourselves, am I moving with the Holy Spirit? Is he involved in my everyday life? Do I forget about him after Sunday church? I know most of us here don't. Do I talk to him throughout my day? Because he's with me. I picture sometimes like he's just right with me, like holding my hand, standing shoulder to shoulder with me. Is he present in your life? Is he a constant companion? Let's explore new ways to have a with relationship with him. And so, Holy Spirit, I just pray that you would blow afresh in here right now. Lord God, we just come and we say, blow. Lord God, blow off the dust, blow off the cobwebs, blow off distraction, blow off encumbrances, blow off disappointment, blow off routine. Lord God, we just yield ourselves to you and we say, blow. Blow, Holy Spirit. We want to be fresh in you. Number two was one I especially, especially loved. It said, having the color and appearance of young, thrifty plants, lively, not impaired or faded, as when you say the fields look fresh and green. When I read that, the first thing that it made me think about was a beautiful tree that John and I saw when we made a recent trip to Arizona. And it's called the Palo Verde tree, and it's the state tree of Arizona. We saw it everywhere. It grew on the sides of the freeways. It was everywhere. But when we went to the Desert Botanical Garden, we got an up-close view of it where we could actually look at it and touch it. What's unique about this tree is that the trunk and the branches are green. They are a beautiful spring green color. Not only is the color amazing, but the wood is very smooth. It almost looks shiny, and it's very smooth to the touch. The tree stays green even in the midst of drought. When it's drought, the, the tree will lose all of its leaves, but the, the trunk and the branches remain this beautiful green color. For all of you that have completed your third grade science classes, you know that photosynthesis <laughs> is the process that plants go through to, com to get their food and nutrients, and that takes place through the leaves. But God, in his infinite wisdom, had this tree that was going to grow in a de desert climate, and the leaves would fall off, and then that tree still had to make its food, and so he made the trunk and the branches be green. Here in Spokane, when the trees lose their leaves, many times we'll look at that tree and wonder if it's still alive. Or, and throughout the winter, you know, sometimes we'll get an early frost or whatever, and some of the leaves will actually freeze, you know, on the, the branches, and the tree just looks ugly, and you think, is there any life left in that? But the Palo Verde tree looks alive all the time. Even when it loses its leaves, it's truly a picture of freshness. And so with the tree theme and with the fresh theme, I went to Psalm 92, verses 10 to 15. Psalm 92, verses 10 to 15. But you have exalted my horn like that of the wild ox. You have poured over me fresh oil. My eyes have seen the downfall of my enemies. My ears have heard the doom of my evil assailants. The righteous flourish like the palm tree and grow like a cedar in Lebanon. They are planted in the house of the Lord. They flourish in the courts of our God. They still bear fruit in old age. They are ever full of sap and green. To declare that God is, or the Lord is upright. He is my rock 
and there is no unrighteousness in him. We can daily ask the Lord for anointing with fresh oil. We can come before him. He gives us what we ask for, and he pours his fresh oil over us. The Hebrew word for fresh is tari, which means not yet dry or brittle. It means to be moist. So let us be fully saturated with fresh oil and on a frequent basis. The psalm says that we flourish like a palm tree. So the definition of flourish is to grow luxuriantly, to thrive, to achieve success, to be in a state of activity or production, to reach a height of development or influence. So here in this verse, flourish is parak, which means spontaneous growth. It speaks of something like just springing up and blossoming abundantly. It would be abundant and luxurious in growth. In scripture, whenever the palm is mentioned, it's always referring to the date palm. The date palm was stately and beautiful, and when you read about the wells, there would always be palm trees around them, or like the desert oasis, there would be palm trees there. The palm has extremely deep tap roots. They're called a root ball, and therefore it can flourish in the desert, it can grow tall, and it can live a long time. It is also one of the most useful of all trees. It produces not only dates, but sugar, wine, honey, oil, resin, rope, thread, tannin, and dye stuff. Its le seeds are fed to cattle, and its leaves are used for roofs, fences, mats, and baskets. That is a lot of useful productivity coming from a single plant. Creativity and multi-resourcing abounds when you think of the palm tree. The palm tree knows how to keep it fresh. It's said that the fruit on the date palm gets sweeter as the tree gets older. Compare this to the believer that's mentioned in verses 13 and 14 where it says that those can be planted in the house of the Lord and shall flourish in the courts of our God. Notice in verse 14 it says that they are ever full of sap and green. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing. And we all laugh at the word fat, I know, but this is like an abundance, not an overweight problem, all right? So don't get hung up on the word fat. It shall be fat and flourishing. The word flourishing in verse 14 is different than the word that was uh, in the previous verse because it means continuous growth. Where the first one meant spontaneous, the second one means continuous. It is something that has sprung up and it's been abundant and it continues on and on and on. It would be a tree with its roots in the house of the Lord, but with its branches reaching out into the courtyard. The tree would be full and extend out where people could come and rest under its branches. It would be a tree of great delight. So Lord God, we just say, Father, make us flourish like the palm tree. Lord, that our roots would grow deep. That they would go deep, deep, deep down into you. Where we continually draw from your resource. We continually draw from your surplus. We continually drink you in. And Lord God, we thank you that you make us useful that you purpose us to do so many things. And Lord, that we are full of sap and that we will be green. Lord God, as long as we keep ourselves in your courts, in your house, that we will produce and we will bring forth life to all of those that are around us. Lord God, this morning, just cause our roots to grow deeper. 
Cause our branches to reach out. Lord, make us fat and flourishing. And Lord, you know the right kind of fat. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. So if we go back and look in verse 12, it says we were going to flourish like a palm tree and we were going to grow like a cedar. And I was intrigued why the verse would talk about two different trees. I knew that it, to mention two, they had to be different. And so I wanted to look up what a cedar was and how the cedar was different. It said the cedar trees of Lebanon were far different from the scrubby, scrawny trees that we might be familiar with here in the Northwest. They grew sparsely in the Holy Land, but they grew primarily in the mountains of Lebanon. The cedars grow very, very tall, often to a height of 120 feet. They grew tall and they grew broad. Sometimes their girth, that's the around them, would be 40 feet. They grew symmetrically. And often their branches would start about 10 feet from the ground, and then their branches would grow out at right angles, and they would be very symmetric. The growth of the cedar is very slow and steady. There is no quick springing up. In fact, it takes three years for a pine cone to mature to be able to release seed. The cedar tree was very valuable. It was the choice material for the masts on ship. And we know that it was imported into the Holy Land when they went to build the temple that they brought in the cedars from Lebanon to build the temple. Valuables were kept and are still kept in cedar chests because they keep out moisture and they also have a very aromatic wood. The aroma is known for keeping out moths and other cloth-eating insects. Oftentimes, when young women would graduate from high school at the turn of the century, they were given a cedar chest to keep things in as they prepared to get ready to be married. The cedar is also an analogy for our Christian growth and experience, and that growth is a threefold expression. The tree, first of all, took time to grow downward. This was an absolute necessity for growing in, the Leban in Lebanon on rocky mountains where there wasn't a lot of soil. They had to put their roots down deep because on the top of the mountain, the wind would blow and they would bend the cedars over and they could crack them and even uproot them if they weren't deeply rooted. And so they took time to really extend their roots deep down. I mean, if we think back to our windstorm that was here in November, most of the trees that went down were um, types of pine trees, but they didn't have a deep root structure, that their root structure, because we have so much moisture here, that the roots just grow more, you know, just a few feet down and extend out. And that's why when that big wind came through, those trees were totally uprooted. The ones that came up, you could see their root system, and you noticed that it was all pretty surfacy on it was shallow yeah and so the cedar is different because the roots went down deep into the soil in psalm 29 david says that they are so securely planted that only the voice of god could break or uproot a cedar tree that's a powerful root structure there <clears throat> it's important for us as christians to be deeply rooted. Our roots must go deep. Sometimes we want to measure our growth in outward ways. Like we want people to see us ministering. We want to see, you know, they need to see us on worship team. They need to see us praying at the microphone. And sometimes some of us can look at people and think, well, they're not doing any of those things. Perhaps their relationship is not strong. But there is so much to be said for that season of life. And really, it's a continual season where that root structure is just going down deep, deep, deep 
into the ground. And, and when you're in that season where you're feeling like there's not a lot of outward productivity coming from you, know that the Lord is still taking your roots deep. He's, and sometimes it'll be a season almost of preparation where right before something difficult is coming, he will have you in a season of your root structure just going another five feet down. So embrace those seasons and know that, that, that there is freshness that can come in those seasons as well. Then the cedar grew upward. Like I said, some of them could be 120 feet. It didn't grow like the bamboo tree, which grows extremely fast. It was a slow process. Emphasis in the scripture was most often placed on the tallness of the cedar. Height would be its most recognizable characteristic. So there's seasons where we're growing upward in stature. In fact, that's what it always it would said about Jesus. You know, we, we heard about him when he's a baby. Then we heard about him when he was 12. And then we didn't hear about him again until he was 30 and starting his ministry. But it said that he grew in stature and wisdom. And last of all, the cedar tree grew outward. The scripture also describes the broadness of its boughs. Its branches grew so broad that it became a shadowing shroud, just like a giant umbrella for all the animals that would leave the heat of the day and would come and sit under its branches. As believers, we need to broaden, we need to grow, we need to have those branches that extend outward so that we can be that shadowing shout, that big umbrella that is a place of safety for our Christian brothers and sisters to come and sit and also for people that have needs to come and sit in our shadow. The cedar was fresh in that it was growing in all directions. It was growing down into the earth, building strength. It was reaching upward toward heaven in stature becoming able to bear weights and burdens, and it grew outward to become a place of safety and shade for animals and the birds of the air. We can draw lots of fresh applications from the cedar. In growth, there is always new activity. Even when we don't see it and we're not aware of it, growth can be building things in us and helping us to minister to others. So, Lord, in keeping it fresh, we embrace flourishing like the cedar. Lord God, that we will embrace and delight in every season of our lives. Father, the season where you're taking us deep down into the things of you, where you're anchoring us into you, where our foundations are just being tied straight to your heart, straight to your purpose. Lord God, where you're preparing us so that we can't be easily uprooted. We thank you for those seasons and we embrace them with a happy heart. Lord, we say, help us to grow tall and strong, that we can stand like a beacon that would shine out, that people could grab hold of. And Lord, help our branches to extend outward where we can be a place of safety, a place of rest, where animals and birds can come and be in our shadow, to be in our shade, where they can be ministered to. We thank you, Jesus. And that number two is the longest definition, Ex expository. So do not despair. I actually am getting close to being done. So deficient de definition number three was having the appearance. Everyone's going to like this one. So just get ready to give a shout. Having the appearance of a healthy youth. <laughs> All right. All right. So we can embrace that one with excitement to have the appearance of a healthy youth being childlike. We had our prayer, 24-hour um, prayer this weekend and uh, Friday to Saturday and yesterday morning. We were in here with the children and we um, flagged and then we pa passed around a beach ball that had uh, words that we would read and, and declare over one another. And then I just let the children pray, play 
with the beach balls, like soccer balls in here. And we just prayed and we released a childlike spirit in the house. We released joy. We released fun. That being a Christian does not mean religious duty, that we can never have fun. And that's part of yours. That's yours to grab a hold of in keeping it fresh. In keeping it fresh, return to your childlike faith. Return to your childlike joy. Return to your childlike expectation. You know, kids always think the greatest thing is about ready to happen. We need to grab a hold of that again. Keep it fresh. Grab a hold of those childlike things that you let go. And partly what a thing I've been um, trying to do more is a lot of times when I would pray, I would say, Lord or Jesus or King. And I've been challenged to just start saying Father and Dad and Daddy and Abba. That's part of grabbing a hold of that childlikeness is to being able to engage with the father as a father. Number four is recently grown like fresh vegetables, not preserved or frozen or canned. Recently grown. You know, they are, all the scientific studies now are saying, and obviously all that is better for you than anything that's been processed. But how many of us like our processed Christianity? How many of us get okay with doing the same old thing every time and there's no life left in it? We need to keep it fresh. Embrace the fresh. Eat fresh. Johnny was going to bring me a Subway sandwich up when I said that, but um, <clears throat> we need to keep it fresh. Are we able to embrace change? Are we able to embrace new things and growth? Can we get excited about those things? Do we let our brains even think of new ways of doing things? Do we allow ourselves to get in a rut? Do we have somebody that's willing to come behind us and kick us out of the rut? Today, Holy Spirit, you come right now and give us that kick. Give us that nudge. Get us out of the rut. Lord, we want it to be fresh with you. And so we embrace change. We embrace new things. Not that every old thing is bad, not that every old thing is gotta, has got to go, but Lord, we do embrace things that breathe new life and freshness into the house and into our relationship. Number five, not impaired by time, not forgotten or obliterated, which means to destroy utterly all trace of or significance of. The story is fresh in my mind. We choose not to embrace a mindset that tells us that we're old and done, or we've, we've been with Jesus for 20 years, and so if somebody else can do it, and I'll just kind of ride, ride on till the glory day. Um, you are not forgotten or erased. We can never let age dictate our value in the kingdom. I am always telling the children in the church that they aren't too young to be used by God. They may be small in stature, but they've got the same Holy Spirit on the inside of them that you've got in the inside of you. And likewise, if they're not too young to be used by God, some of you are not too old to be used by God. You have to keep it fresh. When you yield to the Spirit and keep yourself young in your thinking, new things are going to happen. I love that Rocky and Joyce came into the Koinonia group in their first week of leadership and said, the Lord is making us younger. I mean, they proclaim that over the whole group. 
That's a part of keeping it fresh, declaring the Lord, you are making me young again. We need our seniors to stay in the game. And not just our seniors, we need everyone to stay in the game. Be fully alive. Number six, recently from the well or spring. Pure and cool, not warm or vapid. There's another one of those funny words. Vapid means uninteresting or dull. So not warm or uninteresting or dull. Pure and cool, straight from the well or the spring. This is a beautiful picture. So many of the songs that we've been singing, even this morning, they celebrate us dancing in the river and stirring up deep wells. There is a freshness in the river and in the well. We want to be in a river, not in a swamp. I have been to a swamp. It is gross. I guess there might be some kind of natural beauty. If any of you are swamp lovers, I apologize. But it's kind of muggy and buggy and smelly. John 7, verse 38 says, Rivers of living water will flow from the heart of those who believe in me. A swamp is a stagnant environment that hoards and retains water. It does not release. There is freshness where there is a flow. And so, Holy Spirit, we want to keep it fresh. And so, Lord, we say we will dance in your waters. We will drink from your fresh streams. That we will release that water back out that we won't hold on to or hoard that which you have poured into us. But Lord God, we release from your well. We release from the spring that you have put inside of us. And Lord, may that water supply never grow minimal in flow. May it never dry up. Lord, keep it fresh inside of us. Lord, we just embrace dancing in your river. Lord, and not just like the ankle deep, but Lord God, we want it to go over our heads where we can just swim and be totally immersed and covered and refreshed. Refreshed in your water. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Number seven, repaired from loss or the process of becoming less, having new vigor. Something can become fresh by choosing to have new vigor. We can make a purposeful choice to jump in the river and get rejuvenated. This applies to everybody. If we're just willing to take the plunge, he will be faithful to repair us and reinvigorate us. So Lord, when we jump in that river, we know and we trust that you are going to fix every wounding, every brokenness, every hurt, that you're going to come and restore and bring life and freshness. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. We can become fresh where we felt weary and broken. Lord God, just one encounter with you, and we can be refreshed and restored. So today, Lord Jesus, for those that are feeling dry or broken, I just speak your refreshing waters to just hit them like a wave, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. And number eight is sweet, in a good state, not stale. It speaks for itself. You get stale when you get dried out. So again, submerge yourself in the moisture of his word, in fellowship with one another, in worship, and in serving. So that completes my list of definitions. The first one was moving with celerity, which meant rapidness, like a fresh wind or a breeze. Two, having the color and appearance of young, thrifty plants. Number three, having the appearance of healthy youth. Number four, 
recently grown. Number five, not impaired by time, not forgotten or obliterated. Number six, recently from the well or the spring. Number seven, repaired from loss or the process of becoming less, having new vigor. And number eight, sweet, in a good state, not stale. So those are the eight definitions, but I have one more thing I want to share to challenge your way of thinking. The PEAK students have been, are they just uh, wrapped up a series on relationships, and one of those nine sessions was on love languages. I know many of you are familiar with the love languages, so I'm not going to do a big long teaching on them, but as a refresher, they are quality time, acts of service, words of affirmation, touch, and gifts. We all have a primary love language that we operate out of. That would be the way that we like to receive love. So if you're an acts of service person, you feel loved when people help you out, when they do things for you, when they lighten your load, when you can go and help. A lot of moms, this is a love language. It used to be mine. I've kind of transitioned out of that somewhat, not having seven children at home anymore. But uh, acts of service. If you are um, a words of affirmation person, you like to be told how wonderful you are, that you are loved and appreciated. You like to get verbal compliments. We also learned that you tend to give love out in the same manner that you like to receive it. So if I like acts of service, the way I'm going to show my love is acts of service. But if you're married to a person that has a totally different love language in you, that's not going to nourish them. So if you're an acts of service person and you're married to a touch person and you're always doing things, things for them, doing things for them, fixing them meals, you know, making their favorite dessert, um, wearing their favorite clothes, you know, just those kind of things. And they're a touch person and you never hold their hand or you don't put your hand on their shoulder. You are starving them to death. And so what we learned in that series is that you need to know what your spouse is and you need to know how to get out of yourself and minister out of what's normal to you to meet the needs of your other person. So this kind of got me thinking, how do we show our love to God? Do I minister to him out of my love language? I do do a lot of acts of service for God. In fact, sometimes I really get hung up on that whole Mary Martha story and come under a lot of condemnation. And then I realized, well, the problem with Mary was uh, Martha was not so much the, that she was the doing, it was that she was complaining that Mary wasn't doing. That was why she got chastised, <laughs> was because she was complaining about that. I feel like you can do things and have it be an act of service. If you're doing things to hide, that's something totally different. But if you're doing things, out of your worship to the Lord, then that can be that. But it started me thinking, I thought, well, Lord, to keep it fresh, maybe I should start looking for different ways to show you my love. Like something that's outside of my comfort zone. Something that will stretch me, but something that will definitely keep it fresh. I think that's why flagging has become so f popular, so fun for so many people here because it's a new way, an outside of the box way to release love to the Lord in a different fashion. So my challenge would be release freshness into this house and expand your love language to the Father. 
He's everything, so he can respond to us comfortably in all different ways. I've often thought, I don't know if you guys notice, like when John prays, he often says Jesus and Father and Lord, like throughout his whole prayer. John's love language is words of affirmation. And I thought, it just hit me this week, I thought, wow, he is affirming the Lord in who he is the whole time he's praying. Not only is he pouring out his heart, but he's also affirming the Lord. You are Father, you are Lord, you are King, you are Jesus. I mean, just throughout his whole prayer. So it gave me a whole, like, wow, that is really cool. So that's another challenge for keeping it fresh. Know what your love language is. Think about how you express your love to the Lord and try to do something different. It might feel uncomfortable at first, but I guarantee you that there will be life that will come from it. So right now I just want to pray and I want to release freshness in our house. Lord, I just release creativity, rivers of refreshing, pools of transformation, Show us how to serve in new capacities in the neighborhood and in our city. Lord, increase our prayer and prayer groups. Kindle in us spirits of gratefulness. Show us discipling and mentor relationships that we could step into. Increase our quiet time or bring us quiet time. Lord, give us new awareness to ways that we can express our love to you. Holy Spirit, we just say blow in this house. Blow off the dust. Blow off the familiarity. Blow off routine and habit. And Lord God, open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to just have an expectant spirit to encounter you in new and fresh ways. We thank you, Lord. You are so, so good. So, Jesus, today we choose to embrace keeping it fresh. We want you to bring us back to the zeal and the heart's delight of our first love with you. Father, on this Resurrection Sunday, awaken us. Stir inside of us. Thrill us. <laughs> Soak us, saturate us, that we would be close to you and that we would release your presence everywhere we go. You are so good. You are so good. Thank you, Lord. Amen. And so today, as a step in releasing our freshness, we're going to take communion together. And as we celebrate the remembrance of his body that was broken for us and his blood that was poured out to cleanse our sins and restore relationship with our Heavenly Father, I challenge you to have it be new and fresh. Don't let it just be something that you've done over and over, that you kind of know what it means and you can kind of go through the motions, but just ask the Lord to just purpose in your heart to grab a hold of something new that the significance of the history of this day and that the fact that it's not just a historical event that we celebrate, but it's an everyday event that we take part in, his resurrection life that's inside of us. And so if the worship team, yeah, they're going to come back up. And we have um, the bread and juice up here. This table on this side does have a gluten-free cracker option for those of you that um, are gluten-free. So if you are gluten-free, you need to go to that table. That's the only one that has the gluten-free uh, cracker on it. Okay? And so we're, we'll just take some time. And I just want you to, first of all, ask the Lord to make it fresh, that the depth of his sacrifice and the depth of his love would just encounter your heart today in a new and fresh way.
And we'll go ahead and sing a little bit first with the worship team, and then we'll just excuse you to come up. We do have open communion here. You don't have to be a member to take communion. Anyone is welcome to. Children, um, it, we are open to the, it's up to your parents. If they want you to take communion, communion, we leave that to the parents um, to instruct and to teach on what's happening there. And so after we sing through the first time, then we'll release you to go ahead and come on up. We pulled the tables back so that you can cr go all the way around. If you want to stay up here and take communion together with your family or with other people around the table, if you'd rather take the uh, elements back to your seat and sit down and take it in a private fashion that way you do whatever feels fresh to you today okay so we're we're providing it here but you just take communion with the Lord how you want to embrace it this morning amen